Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, well what a start. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed those last two presentations. I hope you're going to enjoy this one. Um, I, I hope I've not set myself up there by saying that. Um, I will indeed um, be talking about what, what I wonder we're going to say it by, uh, in 2050 is going to be the hardest part of the energy transition, which is getting the whole thing going. Um, the 2020s. So by, I'm, going to take, I'm going to take a look um, at where we are today um, in terms of oil and energy demand. Um, take a look at some of the projections, um, other sources that um, uh, we haven't seen before. Uh, some, uh, Lucia shared quite a few things from the, uh, from the IEA. I'm going to show another of, of the IEA's lenses on, on uh, demand projections out to 2030. Um, I'm going to take that into a bit more detail going out um, into the transportation fuels um, and have a look at the grid of, um, of different options that are going to be emerging, a, a whole multiplicity of different um, future fuel options and, and, frankly, bulk liquid storage options such as CO2 that was just mentioned by Matt. Um, uh, which way is forward, which is back? Where do I point the clicker? Sorry, where do I point the clicker? Oh, there we go, sorry. Start again. Yes, yeah, so, so let me introduce myself first. So Mark Waddington, I'm a director at Channel Energy. Channel is a, um, is a small uh, boutique advisory business specializing in the, um, in the downstream oil and energy supply chain. Um, we, do, we do market studies, um, we do um, oil and gas country studies, we do due diligence, um, we do strategic studies for our clients. Um, we're all seasoned energy industry professionals, mainly commercial professionals with 30, or 30 years or more experience of, uh, of the sector. Um, we consult in Europe and the Middle East, um, and the astute amongst you will observe that we even think that um, Mongolia is part of Europe, um, at data point 11, um, and we also think it's slightly north of Moscow, so apologies for that. Um, uh, we're also heavily involved in, in Africa, where we, do, um, where we do a number of country-level policy studies, um, often, um, often backed by uh, World Bank and IFC, um, and more recently we've uh, we've started working in um, uh, in the Caribbean. So I'm going to cover, as I mentioned just now, um, we're going to take a look at the fundamentals of where we are today, uh, the crude oil outlook to 2030. Um, I'm going to talk about that from the perspective of today's data and the IEA's projections. Um, we're going to take a look at this future fuels grid. Um, and then I'm going to go down in a bit more detail on transport fuels. And this is going to be one of the harder nuts to crack. It's, um, it's a very expensive sector to decarbonize. And we're, we're going to take a look at what's happening there. And I'll talk a little bit about why it's difficult. Um, that will include looking at HVO and SAF. Um, I don't think I have anything on the marine fuel options, but I'm happy to discuss that in the panel. Um, and then we'll touch briefly on LNG and LPG. Okay, what's driving demand this year? Well, we've already talked about it. There's a war going on. Um, but what's, what I wanted to share here was a couple of things. Well, first of all, so the blue line on, um, from left to right, and it follows the, uh, the scale on the left-hand side is the oil price. Uh, the price of Brent crude oil from, as, as published by Argus. Um, and the um, orange, the orange uh, line across the middle, um, the orange area marked across the middle, is the, the market contango or backwardation. So um, when, the, um, uh, when, when the shading is below the line, that's when the market is in contango. Um, and I'm sure most of you will already be familiar with this, but contango is basically a, a set of market conditions that favors storing oil. Um, it usually means that the market is oversupplied. And backwardation is the opposite. It's when, uh, it's when the market has, is very tight on supply um, and there's very little incentive for, um, um, for, for oil to be stored um, in, order to, um, in order to take profit on it. 
Um, so no surprise at the moment, we're in an extremely um, stressed energy situation with, um, with a high dependency on Russia that we'd rather not have. Um, and um, that has spiked the price and it's also created a very strong sense of backwardation as well. And I'm sharing this because this is the world we're in today. Um, I'm also sharing it as, as some kind of level of reassurance, because I know a lot of you as storage operators may be, may be missing some core volume that you would see when energy traders are storing. Um, but what the, um, what the air of shading is showing you is that in the long term that will come back. The, the other thing it was reminding me is, is um, especially when you're in a commercial operation, is, is how sometimes memories can be quite short. Um, it seems to me that a lot of us um, who are associated with the, with the fuel supply chain and, and um, oil storage and supply and so on were, were quite worried around 2018, 2019 about IMO 2020. Well, by, um, by March 2020, we'd forgotten all about that because we were having a pandemic. Um, we then had the stresses of recovery from the pandemic, and now we have the, the, the increased stresses on, on the whole economic system from, uh, from waging a war. Um, the outlook. Now, the, the first thing to say about looking out to 2030 is, so let's, let's, so we're, we're, we've seen the long-term perspective and um, the, um, the, the, what was the word you had for it? Casting back. Uh, um, the, this, this, the, if, you, if you're kind of like looking back from 2050 and, you know, where, where, what, how we want things to emerge, basically, you'd think that by 2030 we might be a third of the way there. Um, well, the prognosis is most definitely that we won't be a third of the way there. Um, this chart shows you um, on a regional basis what, um, and, and keep an eye on the, um, on the bars in red, that's oil demand. And if it's above the line, it's growth. If it's below the line, it's, um, it's a decline in demand. So what we see is that in Japan, North America, it says, it says USA, it should say North America and, and the um, and the European Union, with or without the UK, um, are all showing a decline in the use of oil by the, uh, by the end of 2030. And, and some of the work that we're going to go on and have a look at will, uh, will support that. Um, but other parts of the world are, are projected to continue to grow. Um, you, you also may well uh, be aware that his, historically up until we hit the pandemic, oil demand was running up to around about 100 million barrels a day. Um, now, sorry that this chart's got a lot of numbers on it, but uh, focus your attention on the, one, um, the ones marked in red. Uh, in 2019, we were running close to 100 million barrels a day. It dipped down in 2Q 2020 when we were in the deepest throes of lockdown to, um, to around 84 million barrels a day. So that's a, quite a steep decline. And I, I'm remember a lot of people commenting at that stage that, well, is this where the energy transition begins and are we going to uh, not return to those levels of fossil fuel consumption? Well, um, if you look to the projections for 2022 to the right of the chart, and if you look at where the numbers are today, we're already back at 98, 99 million barrels a day. Um, now, that might be comforting if you've got crude oil storage tanks, but if you're worrying about how we're going to achieve the energy transition, it's a different, it's a different picture. Um, so sector-specific options, and I'm not going to go into all of these in a great level of detail, but one of the things in particular to highlight is that more often than not on, on, this, on this chart, which shows you know, the options that we're working with today, um, the ones that we expect to be working with into the 2030s and what it looks like out towards 2050, is more often than not I've needed to put lines on the table to incorporate the number of options the further across you go. Now, that's not to say that all of these options on the right-hand side will be the answer when we get to 2050, but what we're certainly seeing at the moment, and I think is really important, um, is a multiplicity of different options being developed and, and, and people trying stuff that they think is going to hit uh, what we're going to need. And, and one of the big problems that we're having to deal with is um, um, oil has become almost too good for us to get away with and we're entering this kind of period of rehab where we're trying to figure out how we're going to get out of this addiction that we're currently um, sitting with. 
Um, so maybe one or two important ones to highlight because we're going to go on and talk about them a bit more. Um, renewable diesel and HVO, um, which is is a highly popular option um, and is seen by many sectors as a silver bullet and, and that's also one of its greatest challenges because, because of the level of demand it creates. Um, uh, electric power, of course, is, is, is incredibly important when we look at the, the, um, the road transport fuels, uh, the road transport sector, and I'm going to show um, some specific projections on that in a second. Whoops. In fact, I'm going to show them right now. So this is a piece. This is based off a piece of work we we did last year, um, which takes account of two things. It's it's looking specifically at Germany, um, but in the next slide we extrapolate that out a bit further, um, and it's looking at how um, Germany's um, implementation of RED2, um, and to a certain extent Fit for 55, is expected to play out. Um, and it's playing out in the following ways. We've, we first of all, this was done as part of a, a study on some, some bio, deep biofuels investments. Um, so what we were particularly interested in is, is, was two things. What's the, what's the hierarchy of value? And all fuel suppliers see a hierarchy of value of how they, they, um, they use different biofuels um, because they're trying to avoid using the most expensive options. That's just basic uh, business economics. Um, but we base this then, first of all, on, on the way the obligations were going to be playing out, and Germany is aiming for, I think, the number is a 25% reduction in, in GHG emissions from the transport sector by the end of 2030. Um, forgive me if that's, um, if that's slightly out, but it's of that order, and I think that's why you sh the, the graph is showing us going to 25%. Um, and you see that um, a, a large chunk of it is coming from what we call non-liquid fuels. That's actually EVs. What we did here was we took the, the, the economics that fuel suppliers use, we took the regulations as they're being applied, and then we took a forecast of the vehicle park for Germany going out to 2030 and beyond, and that was saying something like, I think the number was something like 8 million EVs. Um, was was the was the figure that they had so that represents the, the kind of then a big reduction potentially in 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 demand for um for fossil fuels um but but actually interestingly enough as well it, it represents a reduction in demand for some of the biofuels as well but the the smart things the smart thing that the regulators are doing is they're doing something that some people call uh, ratcheting which is which is kind of every time that there's an opportunity to make an incremental adjustment to, to the mandates and to the obligations in favour of where you're trying to get to, you make that adjustment, um, and that's what that's what they're aiming to do with all of this, is to move with with the technologies as they become enabled. Um, the, and the, the the point that I wanted to make here comes up in in the second in the second chart, which shows where that gets to in broad terms. And we've extrapolated from that work to look across um, the whole of Europe. But this is, there's quite a lot of numbers on here, but maybe just to focus on the expected change in demand, the table in the top right-hand corner, the expected change in demand of fossil fuels, uh, either gasoline or diesel and gas oil, um, and the, the increase in demand for fame and HVO and so on, and, and for ethanol. Um, and so what we see here um, is, is a decline, but not a collapse. Um, so that might, on the one hand, be reassuring if you're thinking, well, so I do have some use for some, some of my heritage business for some way to come. I think um, it's also broadly in line then with the IEA's picture of the world. Um, but it also doesn't, you know, 13% does not get us, to, it doesn't get us a third of the way to that energy transition. And my, my point is, uh, it's going to take more time maybe than we'd like, and it's just all about getting the right things happening at sufficient pace. Um, so just to say a little bit more about renewable diesel, or sometimes called HVO, hydro-treated vegetable oil, although mainly these days it's not made out of vegetable oil, it's made out of waste oils and used cooking oil. Um, and... Um, generally made using the same production pathways as sustainable aviation fuel. Um, now, these fuels are, 
as a fuel geek, I would say that they are just great because they are just such high quality. It's, it's a superb paraffinic diesel. Um, the, the SAF is, again, it's, it's, it's a higher quality fuel than, than, than the fossil fuels, without a doubt, um, which makes them instantly incredibly popular in various sectors, uh, including sectors who, who see very little option uh, for decarbonisation other than continuing to use liquid fuels. And this is one of our major sticking points, and that's why things like EVs and, and new powertrains are so important. But for, for those who can't, or, or, or people whose, whose houses are heated with heating oil, um, this, this becomes very problematic. So we see sectors who are saying, right, that's what we want. And guess what? Um, the, the price is, is, uh, is high. Uh, and there's a a finite availability of feedstocks, um, which is going to is going to become a serious challenge. Now, these are challenges that you know we, we will find pathways through, and we will find them by being more inventive about the feedstocks, being more inventive about the production pathways. But bear in mind that some of those figures we are looking at in terms of the biofuels and the role that they play in the transportation fuel sector, it actually averages out at around five percent of the fuel pool in Europe. And it's taken us 20 plus years to get to that point. So these things are going to take time. Um, I think we've covered most of the main messages there. The only other thing to say about SAF, it's currently running at about 3 or 4% globally. You see a lot of uh, announcements where people are saying, we're running this on SAF. We've got SAF at this airport. Well, yeah, and it's blended into the aviation fuel. It's a percentage of what's happening. So we've got all of these things have got a way to go. Interestingly enough, you know, we're seeing um, LPG in particular, but LNG as well. Um, it's actually got a bit of a leg up in COP26. Um, unexpectedly, maybe not. Um, Africa and, and other emerging economies um, you use a lot of wood or wood-based charcoal um, as part of their energy mix for, for cooking. Um, and it's the deforestation problem that's associated with that that is giving any kind of anything that isn't charcoal and biomass a bit of a leg up and, and LPG is one of those options for clean cooking so um, and we're we're definitely um, seeing that kind of work supported now and more interest coming on that um, LNG um, as a lower carbon substitute for, for marine sector um, we haven't talked about the marine sector much, but it's, it's, it's possibly got one of the biggest headaches on its hands um, because historically it has taken, the, 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 frank, quite frankly, the, the dirtiest end of um, the barrel when we talk about oil um, as its fuel. Um, and it's now already through IMO 2020 in terms of sulfur, but in terms of IMO 2050 will be expected to do its own cleanup act. And like like the storage sector, the, the investment horizons for the, the shipping sector are very, very long. So one, one wants to work out something that is a reliable economic pathway and, and, and not bet the wrong horse. Um, so it's in for challenging times as well. Um, but both fuels, again, guess what? Right now, a supply security option. We've touched on it already in today's presentations about um, the importance of LNG in the very, very short term as we overcome our dependency on Russia. So, the storage business in transition. Um, I think, so the sector is going to move away from the mon monocultures of, of crude oil and fossil fuel products, but it's going to take time and it's going, to, it's going to take that 20 to 30 years and it'll probably accelerate from the 2030s and beyond as the competing technologies for the future fuels sift themselves out. Um, but in the short term, it's going to require multiple competing um, technologies. It's going to, which, which from the storage sector's perspective means flexibility, versatility, smaller tanks, you know, a lot of the opposite of what's in the first bullet point here, but, but those things are going to become increasingly important. Um, and the other thing that the storage sector, I think, will play a role in is, is, is other activities associated with the energy transition, whether it's energy storage or you know we've 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 been talking to companies about cryogenic storage to to help with peak loading but battery storage as well and one of the advantages that the storage sector has 
by its very operation is it's, 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 it's a place of work that's used to hazardous work, work permit systems, all of those good things. So, um, you know, you, you have the land, you have the availability, you have the possibility. Um, and maybe last but not least, without being tempted to just read that lot out, I think, I think the thing that is going to be the biggest challenge around this is going to be creating the demand environment um, and that's going to require a combination of regulation we saw in my chart about Germany how the regulation actually created that demand curve by forcing things to happen um, it's, it's going to come by you know, convincing consumers that a particular pathway um, is the right way to go so the, the battery EV thing is, is very much happening but what's it going to be and what's it going to emerge to be for heavy goods transportation what's it going to be for the marine sector how that settles out and whether there's more than one option um, who knows that is what is going to uh, that's going to, going to be what is important is, is, is shaping what that demand is going to be I think I'll leave it there thank you very much for your time